want people to see the work that modern day apostles are doing in the kingdom. Every true Christian is sent. It's just a matter of where. Dr. Bryant Wood, thank you so much for joining me uh, for this conversation on Apostle Talk. I glad, appreciate it. Glad to be with you. Yes, yes. So Apostle Talk, uh, the goal here is to tell your story. Well, specifically tell God's story through you of what God mm -hmm. has done in your life. Apostle, very simply, is someone who has been sent. And God has sent all of us to some extent. And so the goal of this is to tell your story and how God, you have a very unique story, and I, I'm excited to dig into this, of a background in uh, mechanical and nuclear engineering, GE, RPI, and then biblical archaeology. Like, that, it, it's quite a jump, and I'm excited to hear all about that, about how God called you out of that world uh, to go into archaeology. But before we dig into that, I, I have got to list off your rap sheet of, uh, it's quite extensive. So, uh, Dr. Bryant Wood, uh, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Syracuse, uh, then got a job working at Knowles Atomic Lab for GE, General Electric, uh, in design, fabrication, and testing of nuclear reactors. Uh, while there, you got a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from RPI, uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute. After 15 years, roughly, in the mechanical and nuclear engineering world, God called you out of that world to go into biblical archaeology. You started off by getting a Master's in Biblical History from the University of Michigan, followed by a PhD in Syro-Palestinian Archaeology from the University of Toronto. Uh, you then got a job working for ABR, the Associates of Biblical Research uh, out of Akron, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, from 1995 to 2000, you were the director of research for them. Uh, from 95 to 2012, you were the editor of ABR's quarterly publication called Bible and Spade. Uh, which you are currently still the consulting editor. Uh, Dr. Wood has served as an adjunct professor for Biblical Theology Seminary in Hatfield, uh, Evangelical School of Theology in Myerstown, uh, served as the adjunct professor at Faith Theological Seminary in LA, Lancaster Bible College in Lancaster, Messiah College in uh, Grantham, Toronto Baptist Seminary in Toronto, and Tyndale University in Toronto. That is an extensive uh, academic uh, career. And, and that's before we talk about field work. I'm, I'm, I'm not even halfway through this list yet. Let's just keep going. Uh, co-director, so as far as field work, you were the co-director of three reservoir surveys in northern Jordan, the area supervisor for the Wadi Timult project excavation at Tel Mascada, Egypt. You're involved in the Negev excavation at... Harovit, did I say that correctly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Harovit in northern uh, Sinai. You were a member of the Wadi Tem Tumalat Project Survey at the Wadi Tumalat, Egypt. Uh, you were a field archaeologist for the Association of, uh, for the Associates of Biblical Research Excavation at Kerber uh, NASA Israel and the director and ceramic typologist for the Kerber L. Makader Excavation in Israel. You are also a specialist in Canaanite pottery of the late Bronze Age, author of The Sociology of Pottery in Ancient Palestine, The Ceramic Industry, and the Diffusion of Ceramic Style in the Bronze and Iron Age. We're two-thirds of the way through his bio sheet here. Uh, you are published in various different academic journals and have received international media attention for the research on ancient Jericho that demonstrated the historicity of the biblical account of the capture of the city by the Israelites. We're going to talk about that. Uh, from 93 to 2013, you were named in various different who's who's, including the who's who of biblical studies and archaeology and the who, who, who's 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 who of international professionals. You have been awarded various different travel grants, including the Endowment of Biblical Research, National Endowment for the Humanities, 
And Dr. Wood has also been given grants from the National Science Foundation to do neutron activation analysis of pottery from Kerbert L. McCater. On top of all of that, you've been married to your lovely wife, Faith, for 65 years, coming up in a handful of weeks. And you have four children, nine grandchildren, and three great-granddaughters. Right. That is an extensive rap sheet, my friend. <laughs> uh, I am very impressed. You have um, quite a history there. So let's dig into this, shall we? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so I've been talking. Now it's your turn to talk. What is biblical archaeology? Okay, well, I appreciate you uh, referring to digging into these matters because that strikes a chord with me. I love <laughs> to dig into things. Okay? No, no pun intended. I love it. <laughs> Keep going. Not only in the earth, but in the library sometimes, you know, doing yeah. uh, research work. Well, anyway, biblical archaeology would be uh, relating the findings of archaeology, mainly the Middle East, uh, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Syria, even uh, over into Mesopotamia, Iraq, Iran, uh, that area. Those findings uh, many times uh, relate to the Bible in one way or another. And so uh, the biblical archaeologist uh, is uh, a person who uh, tries to relate these findings to the Bible. Now, what's the purpose of that? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, it establishes beyond doubt that the Bible is based on historical fact. Amen. Uh, eyewitness accounts. Yeah. And uh, another very uh, important aspect of archaeological findings is we find textual material written in various languages uh, uh, that were in use in the Middle East. And this helps us to understand the languages that the Bible was written in, the Hebrew language, Aramaic, Greek. Uh, so that is very useful. And of course, it illuminates the Bible. We read through our Bible, particularly the Old Testament, we kind of come across these strange sounding names of kings of various uh, kingdoms, uh, Sennacherib and Ashurbanipal and Nebuchadnezzar. Who are these people? Well, they were real people and we've excavated their palaces and their archives. So this gives us a whole background of what the Bible tells us, usually very briefly, but we can fill in the background historically, culturally, religion of those peoples. And so it, uh, in many ways, makes the Bible come alive for us. And uh, particularly if you're working in Israel where these events took place, and you can go to a place where something happened that we read about, for instance, Jericho. Yeah. And I hope we'll talk about the site that I excavated at Kerbal El, El Makater, which uh, we believe to be the eye of Joshua 7 and 8. It's exciting to go to these places and actually dig up material from the time period that the Bible talks about and evidence for the destruction or uh, the walls falling down. <laughs> and so uh, biblical archaeology just really is very helpful for our understanding of the Bible, for the verification of the truth of the Bible, and uh, just understanding it better and being able to uh, really know better the message of the Bible and uh, what it meant to them then at that time and what it means to us today. It must be fascinating and wonderful to be at a site and open up the Bible as you're sitting in, in the dirt uh, <laughs> to read a passage of something that took place there. And I mean, we're so, being here uh, in North America, we're so removed from those actual places where those things happen. It, it, it must be fantastic to sit in that spot where Jericho, Jericho took place and then read of, uh, read of the stories from the Bible. It must bring it to life to a whole new level. Absolutely. And in our site that uh, I was 
in charge of uh, excavating for many years, uh, Kerbert L. McCotter, uh, we discovered, the first thing we discovered there when we started working was the city gate. And of course the gate figures very prominently in the account in Joshua chapter 7 and chapter 8. Uh, and so there we have the gate, the very gate that's spoken of in the Bible. And uh, in particular in Joshua chapter 8, when the Israelites defeated the people of Ai, they took the king, uh, hung him on a tree, and at the end of the day took the body down and cast it into the gate and covered it with stones. We found that at the gate. It was full of stones. No skeleton there. That would have been taken out and given a burial after the Israelites left. But there's the very thing and spot that's described in the Bible. And there's so many examples of that. But that's a personal example because yeah. I supervised the excavation of that gate and uh, that Fantastic. was exciting very so, exciting so uh, talk to me about what does an archaeologist actually do like what what is entailed in the job and and you can use uh, that dig in particular if you'd like as an example well first of all you have to have the training and uh, not only in the classroom but practical training much of uh, archaeology biblical archaeology, you, you learn on the job, so to speak. Mm. Uh, I had my first experience when I was working on my PhD at the University of Toronto. My uh, instructor there, uh, he had a dig in Egypt. And so one of the requirements for getting the degree was to have two seasons of field work. Mm. And so I worked with him in Egypt for two seasons. So uh, fulfill that requirement. Uh, so you have to learn sort of, like I say, on the job. And one area that is very important in biblical archaeology is the study of the pottery that we excavate. Now if you're working in Egypt or you're working in Iraq, uh, these are areas where there's a lot of written documents from antiquity. You find uh, in the uh, area of Iraq and Iran cuneiform tablets uh, of all sorts, historical and literary and business and political and so on. Uh, and in Egypt, many, many inscriptions in the temples and palaces and so on. Yeah. In the area of Israel and Jordan, almost nothing in the way of written material, mm. a little bit, but almost nothing. Uh, the written documents that you recover from Egypt or Iraq uh, help to date, you know, what you're digging up. It would name a king or an event or something. And so the written documents uh, are very important uh, for dating and understanding what you're digging up. Well, in Israel, it's, it's not like that. Is that where the pottery comes in? <laughs> the pottery comes in because uh, when you study the pottery, uh, you find out that it changed through time. Anything, you know, that man makes <laughs> doesn't stay the same. Mm -mm. Uh, we know that for personal experience, you know, car designs change and clothing designs or whatever. Uh, changes through time. And so uh, once you uh, are familiar with the pottery from different time periods, then you're able to date what you're excavating. And so that pottery is very, very important. And the only way you can learn that is by participating in excavations, handling the pottery. And there are a few books available that will help you, but it's really the hands-on uh, experience that will get you uh, to the point where you're able to uh, excavate some pottery and, and date it. So you go to a site where uh, you believe, you know, there's, there's clearly a historic site. You don't necessarily know exactly what it is, but you're going to dig up and, and, and see what you find. So the first step is uh, excavating, excavating right. uh, which has got to be a delicate process because you don't want to 
I mean, you could just take a bulldozer and just, <laughs> but you need to go slowly and methodically sure. to, to, to get the pottery. So what's the next step after that point? I'm, I'm assuming there's a, a catalog that you will document all the pottery? Yes, that's right. As we're excavating, we're very careful to uh, separate the material by what we call a locus, hmm. which is something uh, that you could define as being different from the material around it because uh, you want to kind of keep the same type of material together from the same time period or same uh, destruction event or something like that. So we have to very carefully excavate and determine, you know, the different uh, types of loci, plural, <laughs> uh, that we're excavating. And saving the pottery and identifying it as, com as coming from a particular locus. Did it come from a structure, the wall that fell down, you know, or did it come from a floor level, uh, from a taboon, a, a oven? Uh, so there's all kinds of things you encounter as you're excavating. So you have to separate your material very carefully. Uh, we put the pottery into buckets, we label the buckets as to uh, where it was found and the locus number, the square number, all kinds of data uh, and records uh, have to be kept as you're going along. You might want to photograph some of the material as you're proceeding. Uh, Archaeology is a destructive enterprise because as you're digging, you're, you're destroying what was there. So you have to carefully record it before you go any deeper and find the next uh, layer down. Uh, and so that is a painstaking process. And then begins the process of taking the pottery and other finds back to your dig uh, headquarters and uh, cleaning it up, washing it, uh, identifying it, labeling it, and getting it ready for analysis and study and the pottery in particular you know takes a lot of work because you have to draw each item you know because you want to publish it yeah. so it, you draw the pottery sometimes take some photographs if it's something special uh, and uh, we make up what we call pottery plates we'll put you know uh, all the pottery from a particular locus perhaps or a particular area will go together on one uh, plate and then in your final report you'll discuss all that pottery and uh, the dating of it and significance of it and how it compares with pottery from other sites and and so on so it's 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 a long rather tedious <laughs> undertaking uh, people ask me you know oh you're digging, doing your report now you know uh, How's that going? Well, I say, I tell them it's harder than actually doing the excavation in the field. It's fun digging up things and it's exciting, you know, but to sit at your desk day in and day out working on the pottery and, you know, coming up with the analysis of it, I enjoy that because pottery is kind of my, uh, my area of expertise, yeah. but it's... Uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> How would you say that your history of uh, uh, nuclear and mechanical engineering uh, plays into? That's, that's got to be rather unique in the archaeology world to have that background. How did that play into your role as a biblical archaeologist? Mm -hmm. uh, when I got into the field of uh, archaeology, I was quite taken aback by the methodology they use uh, because I was used to the scientific method yes. of, uh, and I did a lot of this kind of work with GE, uh, gathering data uh, to determine, get the answer to some problem. Perhaps we ran uh, tests on the reactors and recorded all kinds of things and monitored how things changed uh, over the life of the reactor and, and a lot of things like that. So uh, I was uh, trained in a way to collect data, analyze data, and then write a report about the data. Seems very logical. 
well, archaeology is very similar to that. Yeah. Uh, and you're collecting evidence from the excavation, in, p in particular pottery, but other items as well. And you have to analyze them, and then you have to write a report about it. So uh, I was, uh, you know, prepared by the Lord, I guess you'd say, uh, to do this. But uh, going back to when I got into the field, uh, I was just amazed at uh, some of the methods they used. They did not do a lot of analysis of the evidence. They reached conclusions based on uh, majority opinion mm. or the opinion of some esteemed uh, authority figure <laughs> or what they were taught in graduate school, you know. And uh, it, they didn't often appear, uh, appeal to the evidence itself. And so the methodology uh, led to uh, incorrect conclusions in many cases. Yeah. And so I got involved in, you know, s debating some issues in the field because I would look at the evidence. I said, well, the evidence doesn't back up what everybody else is saying about this. So uh, You made waves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's been interesting. So talk to me. When, when you and I uh, had our first conversation, one of the things that uh, surprised me, and I want to talk a little bit more about, is biblical archaeology. I would assume a person who is a biblical archaeologist would believe the Bible. But as you were talking about it, uh, to be a Christ-following, Bible-believing archaeologist is a bit of an anomaly. So, so talk to me about, uh, about that and about, there was one thing in particular that you said th that you learned early on is that you were taught to critique everything and to be critical, be very critical. But you learned that didn't mean what you thought it meant, right? So, so talk to me about that perspective well, on all this, as, as your perspective as a Christian. Yes, what, uh, when you get into the field, you soon discover that uh, the majority uh, of the people in the field uh, do not believe in the historicity of the Bible. Yeah. They take the uh, view that it's a religious book and it's been, you know, exaggerated or perhaps even things made up to support the religious views uh, presented in the Bible. And for somebody uh, like me to come along and say, well, I, I believe it's actual historical fact, what's recorded there, uh, that doesn't go over too well. Uh, there's a very strong bias against the Bible in the field yeah and uh, that's unfortunate because when you look at the evidence it clearly supports the historicity of the bible and so and when you come to a conclusion based on the evidence that supports the bible they will say well this guy's a religious person and he's just out to prove the bible he's biased of course. So both argue that the other is biased, <laughs> right? but you use your foundation of data and conclusion. The right. data supports this conclusion. You don't make right. a conclusion to support your bias. You look at the data, yes. then come to a conclusion, right. and lo and behold, oh, look at that. So let's talk about Jericho. Yes. Uh, let's talk about what you, your name uh, became world known specifically for Jericho and the problem of Jericho. What mm -hmm. is the problem of Jericho? Uh, Jericho is a very interesting site uh, because of what we read in the Bible. We have a lot of details of what took place there. Uh, and uh, it, it's it been excavated beginning like at the beginning of the uh, uh, 19th, 20th century. So going back into the 1800s, it was work done there. And then, of course, in the uh, 1900s. Uh, and so the f first major excavation was done by Germans in the early 1900s. And uh, they reached the conclusion that the uh, city had been destroyed, but it was earlier than the time of Joshua. 
Then an English uh, archaeologist came along in the 1930s by the name of John Garstang. And as far as I can tell, he was not really a Bible-believing man, but he uh, respected the, the historicity of the Bible. He felt the history given there was true history. And he excavated, and he determined, and he studied the pottery. He had found some uh, what we call scarabs, uh, Egyptian scarabs that allowed him to date pottery he found in tombs. And based on that pottery, uh, when he found the same kind on the tell in the uh, uh, destruction layer, he was able to put a fairly good date on the destruction. And he said it was around 1400 BC. Well, the, according to biblical chronology, uh, the Israelites attacked Jericho in 1406 BC. So uh, that was right on what the Bible has to say. And so uh, people accepted that at the time in the 1930s. But then yeah. another English archeologist came along uh, by the name of Kathleen Kenyon. And she was interested in some of the very early material that Garstang had found at Jericho, going back to what's called the Neolithic period. Uh, but of course, when you do a dig, you just don't dig one particular period because you're interested in it. You start at the top and work your way down and you have to go through all the various levels. Well, of course, she excavated that destruction level on her way to the Neolithic level. And uh, she uh, disagreed with uh, Garstang's findings. She mm. excavated uh, the same destruction layer, same time period, but she, based on the pottery again, uh, felt that, that, that the destruction took place 150 years earlier, around mm. 1550 BC. Mm. And uh, she was very well respected as an archeologist because of her uh, very uh, good field technique of excavating. And so everyone accepted her dating. Well, the problem here is that she said there was no activity, no occupation at Jericho at the time of Joshua. <laughs> so this presents a problem. Uh, but everybody accepted that, and it kind of fit with people's thinking, the other scholars thinking, well, the Bible's not historical. That was a legend. Somebody made that up. And so we wouldn't expect there be evidence that would fit with the Bible. So this, this fit people's view, and they were comfortable with that. Well, then I came along and started looking at that same pottery that uh, Gar Garsting had dug and the pottery that... Kenyon had dug, and uh, I could see clearly that Garstang had the correct date, and Kenyon was way off on her dating. And uh, so I've, you know, published uh, my uh, findings on that particular uh, subject. How'd that go over? Uh, well, uh, again, uh, uh, Christians loved it. Oh, this, you know, all this... Uh, stuff they've dug up at Jericho agrees with the Bible. That's great. But others are very skeptical and they say, well, wood's out just to prove the Bible. And, uh, you know, they, they don't take it seriously. Uh, but uh, the evidence is there. And uh, if you don't want to accept it, well, that's your problem, not mine. You know, uh, when you uh, look at the data, it, it supports the Bible. I love that through time, the more we dig things up and dig into things, the more things we find uh, to be accurate in the Bible. Uh, as time unfolds, the Bible also unfolds as far as uh, the, the truth that it tells. Yes. Uh, and I love the fact that there are um, PhDs, scientists, um, Answers in Genesis, the whole uh, Ken Ham and his whole group of scientists, of uh, very, very intellectual, intelligent people that are believers, that believe in the Bible, uh, that, that don't use their bias to define things, but use science to define things, and lo and behold, it, its conclusions are the same as the Bible. Unfortunately, 
uh, the, the biases exist. The, so many people believe um, that when you become a Christian, you need to check your brain at the door, which is very unfortunate. And I challenge uh, uh, anybody out there to go to sites such as um, Answers in Genesis is a great resource. So uh, to wrap things back into the, the purpose of Apostle Talk, if someone is watching this right now and they get so excited about archaeology, what advice would you give them uh, for a future in archaeology? Mm. What advice would you give on, on what path they should take? Mm. Well, if you want to do work in uh, biblical archaeology, re you really need to get a PhD in the field. Uh, you, that would qualify you to uh, participate in excavations and so on. Uh, there are many people that dabble in archaeology and sometimes uh, make pretty wild claims. Uh, you need to have the, a good solid uh, background mm. and uh, that means many years of schooling. Uh, but there are programs available uh, Different schools have uh, undergraduate programs and, you know, graduate and Ph.D. programs. So uh, it, it's a long path. Uh, you need field work, of course, experience uh, excavating. So you need to participate in excavations. And if you're interested in Bible in particular, that means Middle East and Israel and uh, those countries in that area. Uh, and so... Uh, in my case, I got well, what we would say uh, is bitten by the archaeology bug. Okay. You know, I was a little older, uh, and so I had to sort of restart a new career when I got involved. Uh, but uh, uh, if you start when you're younger, then uh, you can get your PhD as a young person and then uh, have a fulfilling life, I believe. Uh, uh, in this field, uh, field work and also research work. There's a lot that needs to be done. We need Christian people in this field to uh, come up with the evidence and uh, to demonstrate the truth of Scripture and illuminate the Bible even more than what we have today. How has your faith changed through your experience in biblical archaeology? Mm. My faith uh, has really been strengthened greatly uh, through my work in archaeology because I've seen firsthand how the findings from the ground, from the time that it happened, agree exactly with the Bible. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, the great amount of evidence we have. Uh, the, the critics will many times say, well, we don't have evidence that that ever happened, you know, that's described in the Bible, or we don't have evidence that Moses ever existed. Well, you're not going to find evidence for every single thing that's in the Bible. And I, I give an example when I do talks on archaeology in the Bible. Uh, I have an engineering background, and so uh, in engineering, if you're working in a factory, say, that's producing a particular uh, item, a widget, let's call it, and you're, you're running these widgets uh, by the thousands, manufacturing, you got an assembly line and they're coming off the assembly line. Well, how do you know that these widgets meet specification? Well, what you do is you sample. The assembly line, you take one of a thousand or whatever you decide and you pick it off the assembly line and you examine it, you measure it, you weigh it to see if it meets specifications. And as long as those samples meet specifications, you say, ah, we're, we're good. They're all good coming off the assembly line. Well, we have something similar in uh, biblical archaeology. We have a timeline of biblical history. And on that timeline, you cannot prove every item that happened through archaeology or history or whatever. It's just no, impossible. No, it's impossible. Yeah. What you can do is sample the timeline. 
So we have a discovery, you know, from the time of Genesis. You have a discovery from the time of the uh, Exodus and Congress. You have a sample, you know, uh, uh, along this timeline. Every single sample that we have agrees with the Bible. So if you have all these examples and samples that agree with the Bible, I think we can assume the entire Bible is historically accurate and correct. Getting back to the critics, many times they will say, well, we don't have evidence for this or that or the other thing. They're making an argument from silence. Because you have not found it, it didn't exist. Well, you can't approach it like that. You're not going to be able to prove every single thing, but you look at the discoveries that have been made. What do they tell us? The Bible is true. Praise God. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, I want to close, as we always do, uh, in prayer. So uh, anybody who's watching and able who would like to join us, why don't you uh, bow your heads if you're able uh, and join me. <sighs> Lord, thank you. Thank you for uh, using Dr. Wood. Thank you for... Uh, uh, the bug that bit him, so to speak, as he said, uh, for biblical archaeology. And thank you for uh, his career and, and the historicity of your book being validated through the work that he has done. Praise you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you, as time unfolds, you give us more and more opportunity to see the history as we dig it up. Thank you for archaeologists such as Dr. Wood and for those people that are out in the field right now. Lord, I pray right now for people who are watching uh, or listening to this, Lord, that, that they will see in Dr. Wood a man who responded to your call. And they'll ask the question, how are you speaking to them? And how are they to respond to that call? And I pray that they'll be receptive to your voice, Lord. Thank you for this time. We love you, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you for your time, sir. I appreciate okay. it. Well, thank you for going to the effort to come here and <laughs> get set up. Yeah, absolutely.